Welcome everybody. Happy New Year. I hope you had a great New Year. I spent New Year's Eve in Disney World in Florida, surrounded by very, very large amounts of people. It was oh. hordes and hordes and hordes of people. Um, but we had fun and that's oh. what matters. We did the silent disco. If those of you remember that we had at our 2019 conference, we had the silent disco and it was super fun. So we we they, we, we did that at Disney World. So, um, so what we're going to do today is sort of a little bit of open, open discussion, um, looking to see where we, where all the successes we've had in the past year, all the struggles we had in 2022, and what we hope will happen in 2023 with the self-determination program. Um, before we we're going to start towards the end of the year because what I want to do in case some of you don't know about it is that a very important directive came out on December 30th, the very end of the year um, about the self-determination program and I wanted to share it with all of you. So I'm going to share my screen, show it to you. And what it says is that um, the th this is about people who are already in the self-determination program and are moving into their second, third, or fourth year. Should I try to make it bigger? Maybe that will help. Okay, that's very big. Um, so what, what, what basically what this directive says, in case you haven't seen it, and you'll see in the chat that Ed has the link to the DDS website where it came from, um, that uh, what they're saying from the beginning is that planning teams, the plan, planning team is the term that they use for the IPP team. Um, they have a shared responsibility to develop and approve individual budgets and to review, notice the word review spending plan, not approve the spending plan, but review it um, for years after your first year of being in, in the program. Um, and that there are sometimes disagreements about what is in the the amount of the individual budget or a disagreement about uh, what's the services listed in your spending plan. And so these disagreements have led to really serious consequences for people to be able to enter their second, third, or fourth year in the program. Because if you don't have um, that agreement and, and a signed spending plan sent with a purchase of service authorization to your FMS, the FMS is not gonna be able to continue to pay your staff or for any of your services. And so it's obviously becomes a crisis for many people. And so what this really, really great um, directive says is that um, individuals receiving services uh, Oh, sorry, um, that, that if in fact there is not an agreement on a certified budget or a spending plan, that the regional center shall ensure that people in the program continue to get their services in either one of these ways at any way that achieves the outcome to ensure the people to continue to get their services. One way may be that the participant has not spent all of their individual budget funds. And so there's still some money left in their budget and you could just extend the date for the current budget and spending plan. So let's say for whatever reason, you have another $20,000 in your spending plan that has not been spent, a very simple way for a regional center to allow your services to continue is to just tell the FMS, we're giving you an extension of the dates. All this money does not have to be spent by you know, January 31st, we're going to extend it to, let's say, March 31st, and then you can, um, no, 30th, March 30th, and then you can, uh, you know, we can continue to negotiate the spending plan or, or the the um, the individual budget. Um, the other way that a regional center can do this is by continuing the current budget and the current spending plan from the previous year by the regional center issuing a new purchase of service authorization for the FMS. Um, and of course, what they are clear about is removing any one-time expenditures. Those one-time expenditures, expenditures are things like 
um, money to modify your home so a wheelchair can go in and out of the bathroom or to modify bought it modify a van um, for a wheelchair, those kinds of one-time expenses. Um, uh, so the, they specifically say that the regional center has to notify the FMS about this extension at least 14 days prior to the end of your budget year. So if you know your budget year, let's say ends on October 31st, and you know it's October 10th and you are not close to an agreement here, you need to make sure your FMS knows this and you need to make sure your regional center is notifying the FMS. Um, and because remember, not all regional centers are following these directives in ways that they're supposed to. They may not even have learned about it. So um, the fact that you have this knowledge is critically important. Um, it says that the new budget and spending plan shall be completed no later than 60 days following the end of the, the previous budget year or, or a notice of action, which means that you've denied the person. A notice of action is when the regional center is denying something. So either denying your budget amount or denying you a specific service in your spending plan. Um, and so they're giving a very specific deadline by saying that the budget and spending plan has to be completed by 60 days um, after the previous year, because we've heard that these things can go on and on and on. Um, so let's see what, okay, that's pretty much, it says that consumers, family members, or providers should contact their local regional center with any questions. Um, so, uh, so that was one of the many, many directives that were issued in 2022. Um, I think it ended the year very well. Um, I'm very grateful to DDS for issuing this clarification, and I think it's going to benefit a lot of people. So before we move, we're going backwards in the year to seeing other progress that was made. Does anybody have any questions in the audience specifically about this directive? And if somebody's asking to send stuff to the email, we're more than happy to put the link in the chat. And therefore, you can just click on that link and you'll have the directive right on your computer. OK. Howard, did you have a question about this directive? I'm offering to unmute you. OK, can you hear me? I sure can. Um, yeah, I do have, have a question about it. Does that mean that? Um, the FMS and the regional center, you have to have a new budget within 60 days after the, I'll be starting my fourth year on April 1st and until the termination. And I was right. just wondering, did that mean that within 60 days of April 1st, they have to have a budget? Yeah, so it says that, you know, you're, you're supposed to be starting to negotiate your budget and your spending plan. You should really start two to three months before your, your next year begins. But what it's saying is that if there's no agreement by the date of the end of your current budget year, which is, I guess, for you, March 31st, Howard, um, that, 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 you, that the regional center has to complete the process within 60 days. So that would be by around uh, eight, May, 30, May 30th or something like that. Um, they have to complete the process by May, May 30th, or they have to provide you with a denial of something like what's called a notice of action. So they have to do this or else um, they're really going against the law. I mean, these directives are kind of like laws. They're, they're regulations that come down from DDS. Um, so, uh, and it says a participant who timely files an appeal will continue to have access to the last agreed upon budget minus the one-time expenditure. So, so I'll give an example. So let's say your annual budget was $50,000 um, and you go into negotiation with the regional center and you've asked for $60,000 for your next year's budget. And they're saying, no, we're only going to give you 45,000. Whatever it is, if you if if you file for fair hearing, if you file for whether to go to mediation or to informal or to actual fair hearing before a judge, 
um, if you filed it in a timely way within the deadlines, um, you will continue to have that $50,000 budget. They cannot lower your budget until a decision is made by the uh, fair hearing officer. Okay, or by the or there's something happening in mediate or, or there's an agreement out of mediation. Well, actually, um, we're trying to get more more staff for me, and um, we originally got the budget increased, um, and um, you know, but we also had to approve my new budget and my new spending plan. And now, oh, so then you're good. What? So then you should be good, Howard. So, so when they approved it. And now I have to go to a financial management server. And what does the FMS have to do before we can begin to go to work on a new spending plan? That's a, a great question. So first of all, they don't approve your spending plan. They just approve your budget. They've reviewed your spending plan to be sure that the spending plan meets all those requirements, like they're, you're integrated into the community, like um, you're not you're, you're you're using generic resources when you need to. So the fact that all of that has been set up is great news. And your your financial management service should be receiving from your regional center a, a signed copy by them of your new spending plan. And uh, what there's they, they have some sort of authorization that they give. I don't, it looks different at every regional center. It's not something that you need to be worried about as long as you hear from your FMS that they've gotten everything they need before April 1st. And so I think the fact that it's now January 11th and you're all set for your next year, you're, you're probably in better shape than most people, I would say. Okay, and um, Judy, by the way, I can't turn on my video camera. I don't know why, but my video camera won't turn on. Oh. You can't see me. You can hear me, but you can't see me. Yeah. I, I give an ask to start video, and maybe if you click on that, it'll work. Try that, Howard. It still says cannot start video. Ah. Okay, so we'll make sure to get somebody in there to help you with that technical stuff. Okay, Howard? <laughs> Go ahead, Tim. I really think that this is an excellent directive because it gives people more time at establishing new budget after the deadline of your next year. For example, who wants to deal with regional center and their budget during the holidays? Let's say I started my SDP on January 1st or December 1st and because of the holidays, no one to deal with this. Yeah, I 100% agree. It's this is a this is a super excellent directive, and um, it's going to really save a lot of people. I see that Beth in the chat is saying that our COC continues to make specific restrictions on spending plans before they will approve. They don't approve it. It's not their job. Um, added respite hours cannot be spent any other way than respite hours. That is absolutely false. That is wrong. It is not true. And that makes my head want to explode. Um, and so we, we, I wish I knew somebody on the Regional Center of Orange County Advisory Committee, Tim Jin and Sandra. <laughs> so, um, so I think that we need to absolutely educate. So, so you know, this is where you all should be complaining repeatedly to the ombudsperson's office. Even if we know or think, I hope we don't think that they're not going to do anything, but somebody needs to do something. I also really believe that somebody needs to file for due process over this. Let's put this in front of an administrative law judge. I commit to you, if I can, that I will be there for that hearing because th there has got to be a case that shows that that is not the way self-determination works. Um, you guys should know something um, on uh, the ombudsman replied, this is Sandra saying this in the chat, that they couldn't say how a spending plan could be determined. Okay, so we, so they they were, so the ombudsperson is on our side, but the regional center of Orange County continues to do something different. Obviously, that's a serious issue. Sandra, do you, I'm going to unmute you for you to uh, tell us what you know. No, the ombudsperson that responded 
which was somebody I don't even recognize their name, uh-huh. said, we can't tell the regional center what to do on the spending plan. So no, they did not support. Oh, it's the opposite. They, yeah, they were not helpful. And in the past, they've been very helpful and come back and replied to all and said, oh, no, no, it's okay. I was trying to put, somebody got 272 hours a month of, of respite, two to one client. Um, and they can't hire somebody for 23 bucks an hour um, because he's a little combative. Um, so they wanted ABA and they have no ABA. So I just was converting it all to ABA and they said, no. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, this is, this is so outrageous. Yeah, it it's, it's against the principles of self-determination. The first one, which is freedom. Which is and freedom. This, is, this person's over 21. We don't need to get an insurance denial, you know, so yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, we got we got to do some intervention here. RCOC, I don't know if any there's any staff from RCOC on this. I'm sure there's not. They wouldn't be coming to DVU's events, but um, if any of them are. This is a problem. I'm sorry. But luckily, okay, we have great I'm people. Not, I'm, not, I'm not on the advisory council. Oh, you're not. Okay. You just show up to the meetings. Okay. But at least we have you going and we have Tim as the vice chair. So, um, and, and we're hearing that it's not only happening at RCOC. We're here, it's ha- we hear it's happening at other regional centers. Um, so, there needs to be some clarification. Um, so, uh, that's concerning. I'll tell you guys a little secret. It's not really a secret because I'm telling you. Oh, wait, let's let, I'm going to let Beth speak first and then I'll tell you what we're working on. Go ahead, Beth. Thank you, Judy. Um, yeah, I'm actually have a meeting with, I think it's Okra next week um, with my advocate to push on that. But um, Orange County, all the way up through their um, fair hearing manager, say that they can absolutely tell you if they grant you additional funding for a specific purpose that you absolutely have to use it that way. We had to write into the, I know, I know, I know. I had to write in the spending plan, fair hearing, respite hours to be used as staff hours or they wouldn't approve it. No, no. no. I know. I mean, no, well, I know. Why, why did we even get this law passed? If, right. if basically exactly. you have to have a one-to-one connection between what the exactly or and what they're in the traditional exactly. system it's like we might as well just stay in the traditional system now I know I had the audacity to try to um buy a voiceover class for my son instead that nope 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 so um I, I mean that's the, the point is that you, they wouldn't pay exactly. for a voiceover class in the traditional system right and this is the way right. for you to access these unique opportunities yeah. in the community so I've had the discussions all the way up with Paula Gray and all the way up to the regional manager, and they've made it clear that that's their interpretation. They're not swaying, um, and that's just the way it is. And DDS basically told me through ombudsman and a DDS person that they're well aware of that, but they're just stymied as to what to do. So it's not just my son, which is what really incenses me. So I was I settled after the informal meeting because I wanted to just get the hours because that was the most important thing I yeah. needed at that time. But um, you know, I'd be more than happy to participate extremely vocally if there's something that we could do on a broader base. Um, yeah. If I could get some more support. Yeah. Yeah, this is, it's pretty. It's the fair. other um, the other area that they're having fun with is um, if you have an adult, they're saying you have to, they don't have to give you additional hours for support, that the family should continue to provide it. And what? there's even a specific directive on that, right? So that's what this whole, I fought from like July through literally last week on this to finally at least get the hours added. So it's a... It's an opportunity, <laughs> as we like to say. So yeah. I'll, I'll quit talking because I don't want to derail the meeting. But yeah, um, no, I appreciate it. Definitely that. deserves attention. Yeah. Um. So, folks should know. Um. I, I'll make it public. I don't care that um the DVU and Disability Rights California are working with the Association of Regional Center Agencies or the uh, the regional centers to try to come up with some language that we will put into law to make 
the process better. We're also working with some FMSs as, as well. And um, I, we've, had, we've gotten some agreement on some issues and some disagreement on other issues. But I'm going to bring this up as one of the major issues because it's this is about control. It's all about control. It's regional centers don't believe that we can have control of our lives. So they want to try to control us in any way possible. Yeah. And that box of the traditional system remains closed. Um, and we have to still fit into that box. And so um, it's this is a very serious problem. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'm going to move. So, oh, so the reason I told you this, that we're working on this is because I, I want you to know that while we provide the STP Connect as a public service to all of you, and by the way, we don't receive any funding, All you're seeing interpretation right now in Spanish and in Korean, and we get zero dollars towards this, zero dollars. We, we use our general monies to pay for this. We actually applied for a grant to DDS to get interpretation paid for at these meetings and we were denied the funding. So this is a public service. So if anybody has any extra money sitting around, we'd love a donation for you at any time. But that's not my point. My point is this, that we provide this as a public service to you, as a, you know, but we really, it's very beneficial to us to hear from all of you. It, it, when I hear these stories, when I hear these concerns, it's not like it sits in a hole in a vacuum and goes nowhere. We take what we hear from these meetings and we use them in our advocacy to try to change it for everyone. We do not, as an organization, provide individual supports. And we, we do it in trainings like this. But I know that I'm seeing in the chat that I've gotten a couple of private messages to me asking if I could help people. It's it's just not what we do at, at DVU. It's it, we honestly don't have the time. I already work like 15 hours a day and that has not, and I don't help individuals. And so um, there are lots of agencies who have millions and millions of dollars to help individuals. And they include Disability Rights California's Office of Clients Rights Advocates and the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. Yeah. And it's that one. It's the OCRA that I'm right. talking to next right. week. So people people know. say I can't get their attention or I can't get their help, but they actually have millions of dollars to do this. Our our annual budget can fit into one of their desks. Or we are such a small little organization. So we don't have the funding to provide individual support. We do this as a public service because we believe in the self-determination program. It is the reason why we exist. But at the same time, um, we appreciate all of you because when you bring me these stories, these stories don't sit. These stories go directly to DDS. And these stories, uh, I sit and, and Connie Lapin, one of our board members, sits on the statewide advisory committee of for DDS of, of, um, of the self-determination program. And so these are things that we try to bring up. And sometimes our complaints are heard and directives are issued, like you saw on the continuation of the, uh, the individual budget. Um, I'm going to wait. I'm just going to see. There's a few more things happening in the chat. Um, Karen is saying, if anyone should question the spending plan, it should be the FMS. They are liable, responsible to make sure we are using the codes correctly, not regional centers, was my understanding. Now it seems the regional center wants to keep control. Yeah, so the FMS is responsible for making sure that we are keeping with our spending plan. It's not so much the codes. We shouldn't have to worry about the codes, folks. We should have to just have to worry that we're keeping with the spending plan and that if we're changing something on our spending plan that we just notify the, the, the FM, our FMS and the regional center. But um, the the problem is is th those things get delayed they question every change and it, it becomes very very difficult so um i wanted to to look back a little bit more into 2022 and see some of the progress that was made in 2022 and i just want to tell you how you can see find this um what i'm going to share my screen i'm going to show you I think that Howard is not, can someone mute Howard here? I'll mute him, I found him, okay. Um, 
So what you can see is that this is the DDS website. You see it's dds.ca.gov. Well, maybe I'll start at the beginning. So everybody knows where to find these. So this is the main page of the DDS website. If you scroll down to their main page, you'll see there's a link directly for the self-determination program. In here is a lot of information. It's your link to the STP ombudsperson. There's information on, on background checks. It has the list of all the FMSs. It program updates means how many people are in the program. Um, and then it has program directives. And that's where we're finding a lot of this information. And so this has every program directive that's ever been issued since the program started. The very first one was back in 2018. So if you want to look at this stuff, some of them are written a bureaucratic way, but this is all public information. And these directives are, are letters sent to the regional centers. So what you just saw is the one most recent on December 30th, but that was run right before that which dealt with independent facilities. And you'll see that they translate them into many different languages. So um, if you, so this one, you may remember, we've talked about this before, that um, they call them pre-enrollment transition supports. So these, these are the supports that you can receive to hire a person or an agency to help you transition in. They, we often call it an independent facilitator, but in, they can't be called an independent facilitator before you get into the program. So, um, so the, they back in July 28th, they issued a guidance that made things very, very different that said that instead of the $2,500 that people could have to hire you know, someone to help them. This, that person doesn't have to be vendored. Uh, it, it's it's a process that's rel relatively straightforward. Um, they're changing it so that a thousand dollars is can go towards um, the similar thing to do person center planning, and then you have another two thousand dollars to spend on helping you with your spending plan and and advocating for you at your IPP. The, the process was supposed to go into effect in February and they have now postponed it. Um, it's now not gonna go into effect until July 1st, this new process. Um, this new process includes having, um, being able to hire an FMS to help you with your spending plan. They, they can become vendored. But then independent facilitators or planners are also going to become vendored as well. They also are saying that by March 1st, which is very soon, they're going to have a standard statewide packet for independent facilitators to become vendored with regional centers. Um, to, and, and they're hoping that it's going to be a, a, a much easier process than regular vendorship, which is a horrible process, and that you will hopefully be able to get out of having very expensive liability insurance, um, which is required and would basically make, make it so that no one would wanna do this work. They're extending all of this to July 1st to work out the kinks. They've also promised to work with stakeholders to ensure that it is going well. I'm not sure if there are any people in our community who've been who've had any outreach from DDS since this came out on December 2nd. It came out on the day of our self-determination conference. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody's heard anything. I have heard nothing. Um, but go ahead and raise your hand if you've actually heard them making progress, but I don't think they have. Um, other things that happened in the past year um, was um, a September directive that said that um, this, this is another huge, great progress, and we're very, very thankful to DDS for this, um, that says that if you live in an area, well, everybody does, because this is, um, California has an increase in its state minimum wage, but you may live in a city or county that has an even higher minimum wage than, than the state. If you live in an area where the minimum wage has gone up and you have uh, a service that is in the traditional system that to make up your budget that is impacted by that increase, you could have an increase in your budget, your individual budget. 
Same goes for the changes in rates for vendored services. So to calculate your individual budget, it's based on what you would be spending in the traditional system. That cost has gone up on the whole. Not every single service has gone up. Independent living services actually didn't go up, um, but supportive living services went up substantially. Um, day program went up, certain things went up. And so you have to look at what were the services that determined your original budget um, the, for this year in the traditional system. And if any of those services are part of the services that got a rate increase, you're going to get an increase to your budget. What The key thing, though, is that you need to contact your local regional center to get that increase. Regional centers are not going to do it for you automatically. I'll be honest, I have yet to contact my regional center to get that increase because part of the responsibility of, of self-determination is you only ask for what you need. And at this time, uh, with my son's budget, he doesn't need that increase. I fully anticipate that in his next year's budget, he is going to get that increase though. Um, and in fact, as we move, we're, we're, we still have many, many more months in, in this year's budget. And if we if I find that he's going to need more money added to his budget, then I will go in and ask for it. So go and ask for that increase based on the increase in the minimum wage or an increase in the rates um, if it's something that you need to meet your goals. Um, I have to tell you, just as far as responsibility, I, I was talking to a, a SDP participant a month ago and who, who said to me at the beginning, oh, yeah, I've got everything I need in my budget. Um, and then later on, I was just mentioning, well, if you did need more, you could ask for an increase in rates. They said, oh, I will. And I said, but you just told me you, you have everything you need. And they said, yeah, but wouldn't we always want more? That, that's not, we cannot have that attitude or else this program is not going to survive. The attitude we have to have is we have a budget that meets our needs. And so if your budget is meeting your needs, then you don't need to ask for it. I know that for many, many people out there, your budget is not meeting your needs. And this is one way to increase your budget, one very important way to increase your budget. But please, you know, Take the responsibility to know that if your needs are being met by your current budget, then you don't necessarily need to go mid-year and ask for an increase. Um, okay. Uh, so this last bullet, I'll try to explain it. It's a little complicated. That if you are using, um, so let's say you're you have are using a supported living provider from the traditional system to provide you services in the self-determination program, and they have received, that particular provider has received a rate increase in the traditional system, that is another way that your budget gets adjusted, okay? So there's three different ways for your budget to get adjusted. All right, so before I continue on, I'm just gonna look, uh, are there any hands raised, Ed? I'm not sure. Nope, you're good, Judy. Okay. Um, uh, it says here in the chat, are the requirements for ind independent facilitators only applicable for IFs bringing new people into the STP? That is correct. So these new requirements are only for those people being paid in the traditional system before a, a person moves into the self-determination program. Once they're in the self-determination program and you want to use the services of an independent facilitator, you just write that service into your spending plan. You negotiate the rate that you want to pay them. And that is how it works. Okay. So it's obviously much easier. There's no, they don't have to vendorize themselves with the regional center. There's no big hoops they need to jump through. I see one person has a hand up. It's Gayatri. Go ahead. Hi, um, can you hear me? I sure can. Um, you know, I I am having trouble getting into the SDP program and I'm really struggling. But in the meanwhile, um, there is a service that I have recognized for my son that I would like to ask from the regional center, from my case manager, 
is this something I can do now or do I have to wait to get into the SAP program to get that service authorized? It's a, it's a, it's a training program. Um, it's more like physical training, which I know that some kids do get, but I don't have that in my son's IPP. The only thing my son's IPP says is a respite and a camp. So is Right. So you're looking, it sounds like you want to do something around social rec. Is that it? It's like a, is it training related to like a uh, gymnastics type thing or physical, physical activity, or is it training like more behavioral stuff? Um, it's actually a bit of both because he does have some physical delays as well. He's severely autistic. So he has some, um, some physical delays. Um, and also some behavior issues. And this person does a little bit of both, like training him to, you know, uh, working on his physical skills. And he's come a long way since we started the program. And it's in a social setting. So he works with one other individual who also has a similar need uh, for development. And so I would say it's both social recreation and also working on um, behavior goals, developing his physical strength, uh, physical skills, you know, I'm not sure how to, how to, does, does that, does that, is, is it too confusing? No, no. I mean, it just depends on, um, so, so what everybody needs to know is if you were moving into the self-determination program, you don't need to be using these services that you are requesting to go into your budget. These should be able to go into your budget just based on the need for these services. So for example, um, if you want to add social recreational programs, which kind of sounds like what you're talking about, what, what most regional centers are doing is having you identify the social rec program you would be using in the self-determination program. I'm sorry, you would be using in the traditional system, even if you don't want to use them. You have, you'll say, okay, it is this gymnastics company or it's this agency, whatever it is, this is what I would want to be using for this service. They would annualize. So let's say that's $100 a week. They'd annualize it. How much would it cost for the year? And they'd throw in that amount of money for, you know, $5,200 goes into your budget, right? So um, you don't have to actually use that service for the year. You just have to make a case for the need for that service. So definitely ask your regional center for these services that you feel your child needs but you don't have to go and start using them if, if they're not appropriate. Just make sure that, that the need is, is agreed upon in the IPP and that service like that is authorized. And then that, that funding will be added to your individual budget. Got it. And then, I'll, um, and then I can go with anybody I want, right? Exactly. That's the great thing is you don't have to use one of the vendors. Um, that the regional center requires you to use. Okay. I did send you a DM as well. So later on, if you have time, maybe, you know. Yeah, it's hard for me to, to read the DMs while leading this session. So okay. what we just suggested, if people have questions, they should try to ask them. And then it's really hard for me to help people on an individual basis. So definitely keep coming to all of our STP Connects and I will always call on you and try to answer all your questions, okay? And Thank you. Gayatri, uh, I just want to mention, sorry to interrupt Judy, I just wanted to make sure she saw this in the chat. I have an email I can send you that's full of resources that can get you started on the STP that I'm happy to um, send to you. I've put my email to you in the chat, so feel free to contact me. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gayatri. You're welcome. Um, all right, I'm going to go back to some other progress that has been made this year. So in September of 2022, DDS issued this directive basically saying that regional centers are required to notify their, the FMSs within three days of any changes to a participant spending plan. So let's say you've decided that instead of taking an art class, you want to take a theater class and you send an email to both your FMS and to your, your service coordinator to let them know. Your service coordinator ha has three days to inform the FMS about these changes. 
Okay. Right now it's been taking sometimes six months. So now they have three days. So um, obviously if there's an issue with the change you want to make, then that might get extended. Um, and they would inform you of that. For example, let's say you're using funding that, that you know, there's three, there's three categories. There's three budget categories. And if you're moving more than 10% of that budget category to a different budget category, that's not going to happen very quickly. That's got to be part of a conversation that you have with your regional center at an IPP meeting. And you've got to explain why, um, why that need is there. The, the other really key thing they said is that regional centers need to be paying um, or they need to establish a schedule, I should say, but they, they have until the end of this month to establish a schedule where they will start paying FMSs on a weekly basis, a weekly basis. And the, that's pretty extreme. I don't think regional centers pay any vendors on a weekly basis. And the reason why um, is because FMSs are either pulling out of the state of California at record numbers, or they are not, they're putting a hold on taking new clients until they start getting paid by regional centers. I can tell you, um, and I got permission to share this with everyone, that I spoke to the CEO of GT Independence yesterday, who is the largest FMS in the state, has about 60% of clients. And they are currently owed over $6 million in back funding from regional centers. That's just not a way that anybody can do business. They just can't do business when they are owed $6 million. And that is not an exception. They are the biggest, and so they're owed the most, but all of the FMSs are owed money. I can tell you that for Aviana has told me they've pulled out of three regional centers. They just will not do business with three regional centers because they're just not getting paid by them. And that's really a problem for these, for the consumers in this regional center through no fault of their own, they're going to have very limited access to, um, to FMSs for the foreseeable future. Um, so if any of you went to our conference, uh, you heard that we talked about the concerns with FMSs constantly. We know that everybody is complaining about poor customer service from their FMSs. We know that people are complaining about, um, you know, not getting phone calls returned, waiting lists, all that kind of stuff. We know that it's happening and believe me, the FMSs know it's happening too. And they're doing some work to try to improve that. My job has never been to criticize the FMSs. My job has been to lift them up and to have them do better. And one of the ways that they're going to, because guess what? If we have no FMSs, we have no self-determination program. They're the only required service. And so if, if, um, if we don't fix this, the self-determination program will whittle away and die. And um, what we heard at our conference um, is that D this is DDS's top priority to fix this problem. They're putting in some changes in the back end with the accounting systems to improve processes there. Um, and um, they're doing whatever they can uh, at this time. Um, many of you may have heard that Susie Reckworth, who is the SDP ombuds person, has been moved from that role to running the self-determination program at DDS in order to produce these substantial changes in a, in a fast way over the next couple months. And for DDS, that's very fast. They move as slower than any agency I've ever worked with in my life. So um, this is uh, th this is critical. I I'm, I actually invited the CEO of GT to join us at a at a future um, SDP Connect in the next month or so um, when she might be available to share with her share with us all of the concerns that she sees in the system. Um, and she has agreed to do that. So I, I will make sure to schedule her, but I am gravely concerned. I mean, how does anyone do business when you are owed $6 million when, and you, you just can't, and you just keep putting out more and more money. You just keep putting it out. The other thing we know is people who have larger budgets, like budgets over a hundred thousand or over $200,000, 
which a lot of adults who live on their own do, they're, it's almost impossible to get an FMS at this point. And it's because they're not getting paid. The FMSs are not getting paid. And that's, so when you are working with a client who has a $15,000 budget and you don't get paid, it's not as much of a liability or a risk for you as, um, as it is uh, for if you have a $250,000 annual budget client and not getting paid. Um, it, it's, so I am gravely concerned, particularly for those of us who are in the sole employer model, because in the sole employer model, you are the employer of record. So my son, we use sole employer. My son is the employer of his staff. And if his staff doesn't get paid, my son gets sued, not the FMS. In the co-employer model, if the person, if the staff doesn't get paid, the, the FMS gets sued. So I mean, this is obviously a very serious problem. It puts all of us at risk if staff don't get paid. And so what FMSs are doing which I appreciate is they're just putting out the money, even though they're not getting paid. But they're not going to do this forever. They're they're going to quit, and some of them already have. So um, somebody's asking, like, why why are the regional centers not paying them? Um, from they're using every excuse in the book, um, including including, I mean, most of it to me is a lot of incompetency in the in the accounting departments. I mean, I can tell you what was said to me um, about one regional center that I shall not name was they used every excuse in the book about why they hadn't paid. It's like, well, you didn't submit the invoice in time or you didn't, you should know that most of you don't know that the way that vendors get paid in the state of California is through something called the e-billing system. It is an incredibly complicated, backward, bureaucratic. I know this because we are a vendor for our little conference and we have to go and ask for $75 for each regional center person who comes to our conference. It's like only 75 bucks. And just filling out the e-billing is like, makes my head want to explode. They're looking at millions of dollars in e-billing that just gets lost. And so, um, so every single time they said, well, you didn't do it for this person and you didn't do it right for this person. We have to streamline this. This process cannot continue the way it is. And apparently DDS is, is really focused on this. I know that if you have any, if you want to weigh in on it, the people to speak to are Susie Rickworth. Um, who has the same email address she had as, as ombudsperson and a woman named Vicki Smith. Um, I should mention, for those of you who went to our conference, we will have for you, hopefully next week, the recordings of all of the sessions of the conference in both English and in Spanish. And um, we will be sending, for those of you who went to our conference, we will be emailing you the links to all of the recordings. Um, for those of you who didn't go to the conference but wanted to have access to it, we will be sending out a way for you to get access for a, a small fee um, uh, to, to be able to see all the recordings. We know that we had 10 sessions going on at the same time, so most of you didn't get to see more than one. And I would I really um, hope that you can uh, watch many of them. They're really phenomenal. Um, I will try to, at some point, Sally, put Susie and Vicky's emails in the chat for you, unless somebody else has them and can throw them in. Um, Karen, you had a, a question? Uh, hold on, what am I doing? Ask to unmute, there we go. Hi, yes. On the FMSs, they give us a budget statement um every month what's paid out right when they give us those budget statements are those the statements that was approved by the regional center and they are getting reimbursed from them as well or is it just their statement that they paid out it's just maybe. their statement they paid out okay yeah because maybe there's a way they can clarify on those statements <laughs> this would be my recommendation that they add another column saying what the regional center actually paid them to date. 
I love that idea so much, Karen. Oh my God. I love that idea. I don't, I don't, I, I'll talk to the FMSs. I don't know if there's an FMS on today who wants to raise their hand. That's a brilliant idea because well, it keeps keep us on top of it. I love keep it. everybody accountable, right? Yeah, I love yeah. it. I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Great idea. Um, a question was asked in the chat that I'm calling, even though it was sent to me direct message, but I love her so much. I'm calling out Sora Markowitz. Um, who asked, if you didn't go to the conference, but you registered for it, yes, you will definitely still get access to all the recordings. Um, we didn't really track who came and who didn't come. We only tracked who registered. So you'll definitely get it. And I love you. Hi, Sorrel. Um, and, and Connie Lapin and Harvey Lapin are waving at you as well. Uh, okay, Debbie asked, can you say anything about why what happened during the pilot period that there are so many very basic issues at this point. That's a brilliant question, Debbie. I actually know the answer to this. The pilot program did not receive any federal matching funds. They had no requirements from the federal government. They had no, they literally had no service code. They had, because they didn't have to file the service codes with the feds to get money for it. So it was very loosey goosey. And um, it's it's a it's it's really quite uh, astounding that it even went as far as it did, um, and that as we moved forward and moved it into a federal into federal matching funds and into a program that has what's called a federal waiver, it, it is amazing to me that DDS did not recognize from the very beginning that this was going to be very complex especially from the accounting side, because the accounting departments at regional centers are set up only to work in the traditional system. They were completely unprepared to manage payments in the SDP with completely different service codes. And it is something that it's not like we didn't know this. We had experts from the pilot project who said, this is going to be a problem. Make sure this is the way you handle it. And DDS did not handle it that way. So I put this, honestly, I put this a lot on DDS for not recognizing what was going to happen in the future. Um, and now we're faced with this giant mess three years into it. By the way, I want to acknowledge that 2023 is our 10th anniversary of getting the self-determination law passed. So we are at a decade, and this is the mess we find ourselves in. So not good. Um, go ahead, Debbie. Um. So I can see why, because of what you just said, I can see why we get into this turmoil about regional centers saying what we're going to do with the spending plan. You know, it seems like there's that big, and, and just to let you know, we're at the process of trying to get the darn budget so we can like see what we can like make into a spending plan. So because there wasn't that system in place, I can see why regional centers say, hey, we want to know how you're spending this money. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what I want to know that as my regional center has spent the money, has spent money on my son, I want to know that I'm not the regional center, as the FMS has, I want to know the, that the FMS is getting reimbursed for every dollar. They remember they're putting out the money first. FMS has put out the money and then get paid back. It's called being paid in arrears in a, in a CPA term. When we first started organizing after the law was passed, we sat in meetings. Harvey will remember. We sat in this meeting at Westside Regional Center for like eight hours discussing how the FMSs were going to work. And we very specifically said, you need to give the money to the FMSs first, and then you can... Um, and then they can draw down from those funds. And DDS absolutely did not agree to that. And so that is why we are in the mess that we are in today. It, it also seems like the very broad idea definition of what is social integration in, a, in the community, that's just such a big, like, 
fluffy on the edges. What does that mean? Um, I see where there gets to be just problems um, with this whole issue about getting to a spending plan and then all these issues about paying for something. So anyway, that just yeah. made me think at this point in time. Thank yeah. you. Well, I mean, th that's something that I'll point out as well, is that during the pilot project, when somebody had a crisis and needed to change their spending plan very quickly, it was seamless. It was literally, I'm, um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the FMS called Community Interface Services. They have very, very few clients. They worked in the pilot. They were one of the biggest in the pilot, um, and they hate the new SDP, so they've not taken any new clients. Um, they're a wonderful agency. And they, they tell this story um, about a pilot participant who was being, was able to travel for the first time in his life because of the self-determination program. He was able to, uh, he, he got a car that the, re, the self-determination didn't pay for his car, but it did pay for certain upkeeps of the car, like the the wheelchair ramp and he had a person who drove the van and the he was scheduled to go to las vegas for the weekend which was so great because he never had that freedom to do things like that and the and the the something related to the van's um system uh to get the wheelchair on it broke like hours before he was to leave and he called his uh, his FMS, which is community interface and says, I know I don't have money in my spending plan to do this, but I would like to move money from over here, which I don't need into repair for my car. And I have a guy who's sitting here waiting to fix it so that I can go to Las Vegas. And it was literally that fast done. And, and the FMS spoke on the phone to the auto company and said, we, here's our credit card. And they paid for it through the credit card. None of that happens in the new system. None of that can happen. It's it is not nimble. It is not easy to use. No one has credit cards. No one's willing to put out money. It's really quite a problem. And once you know, we've got to fix all these problems with the FMS, and then we'll be able to tackle making it making it a simpler process. Um, uh, somebody's asking, uh, can the FMSs take legal action? Oh, believe me, they are. Oh, they are. They're whole, they, they're trying to do other things without doing that. They're trying to negotiate. They're trying to say this or that. But lawyers are showing up to meetings at this point because all of them are owed so much money. It, it's Things are really bad. And DDS knows this, and they need to fix it. Um, uh, oh, Ed, you have some questions. Go ahead, Ed. I sure do. I have three that I'd like to address right now, and I'll let you know if any more come in. Um, I have an anonymous person saying that participants in the, in the 12 222 webinar, that would be our conference, uh, would be provided in a copy of the updated version of Think Outside the Box. Is the manual now available? Oh, yes, I can say yes in that very near future. I have to tell you that I have probably spent over 100 hours rewriting this entire book. I've literally, here's the old book, and it sits on my desk, and I have gone through every single page, and there are virtually no pages that are untouched. Almost every single page has been changed. And that's because this is the March 2021 edition a few months before the program went statewide in, in June of that year. And there have been so many directives, so many changes in the way things work. I wanted to reorganize it a bit. I thank Nina Spiegelman for helping me. Ed Herzl has, is going to be reading it hopefully tomorrow. It is at the graphic designer as we speak. Um, and after Ed takes a look at it, and, and Kelly Coulter Reyes, our SDP trainer, is also going to read through it for content. Um, and after those fixes are made, um, I, I think that uh, we'll have it ready to go to the printer. And the printer usually takes about a week. And then we got to mail them all to you guys who went to the conference. And we also have other people who bought them like three months ago and are waiting for the new version. So give us, give us a few weeks to get it out. But I have written it. I'm like so glad it's over. <laughs> it's like. Oh, you were muted, Ed. 
Thank you. <laughs> Pursuant to that, Judy, we actually have a question from Ethan, uh, which is, are things dynamic enough that it makes sense to keep Think Outside the Box as an online resource rather than a periodically updated book? Oh, yeah. Are you listening in on our staff meetings or something, Ethan? Because we have this exact conversation. <laughs> um, so we do have that resource that sits uh, that can be updated regularly. It's called the interchange. It's this, our self-determination interchange, self interchange. And that's the thing that we can keep regularly updated. Um, and we need to do a little better job of that, but we're hiring two new staff in the next few months to work on those kinds of things. And so we will be keeping it updated. The reason why we print it in a book, honestly, is people love books. People love, it's it's in this lovely little ring. Can people see me? I don't look at myself while I'm talking because it makes me dizzy, but let's see. Oh, here we go. Cause so you can see it. Um, so it has these little rings. It's super easy to look at it. You can fill it out. You can check off, you can highlight people. That's a lot of the way a lot of people learn. Um, we were hoping at some point to get funding to do even more than this. We, we get almost no funding to do our self-determination work. I, I need people to know this. We Our advocacy, the SDP connects, the think outside the box, we get no funding to do anything around self-determination. And so we make a little bit of money off our conference and we make it, I mean, we don't even actually make money on selling these things. We just cover most of our expenses. And, um, and so uh, what, what we wanna get to the point of is get a grant to create videos for everybody. Cause I think that's the way a lot of people learn is let's, let's take parts of the self-determination program and create little animations. To, um, this, is, this is how you do a spending plan. Um, we wanna do all that. Um, I'm waiting for DDS to give the money out to do it. DDS got funding that I helped to get them back in 2021 to give to an agency to create brand new orientations. And they have still not distributed that money. Um, they gave some of it to the state council to do, or, to do a new orientation and it was pulled back from them and DDS wrote their own orientation, which is not very good. Um, and But they still have lots more money to spend. They had $600,000 to create new orientations and none of it has been spent. And I urged, I urged them. I urge them to, because to, DBE will apply for that money. We have a million ideas. We have self-advocates who are ready to do, to lead the trainings. I don't know what else to do. Um, Jordan, my friend Jordan, hi. Hello, good, good new year to Happy you. Happy new year. Thank you. Of all the depressing things you said, I have to ask the question is, and I'm in, and I, this was a harbinger of things to come. I spoke about this whole thing about vendoring people for months and months and months and months and months and months and realizing that people are even my own vendors have been taking months to get paid and mm -hmm. so my solution and other people have agreed that the credit card that you mentioned is the only way to do it because if we don't center is not paying the somewhere there's bottlenecking or there's a gridlock between we don't center paying fms's or fms is not paying vendors so in good faith, I couldn't, I don't want to vendor somebody and risk them not getting paid. And so my question is, and I'm going to channel Harvey Lapin, who would say that the best model to be in is a sole employer model. Well, right now, that would be the worst model to be in because I'm in it. And if my vendor or employees aren't getting paid in a timely manner, I'm the boss. So what happens? They could sue me. They can come after me. Where's Vito Center? absentee, they're not, they're not going to care, but the employee and the vendors will say, look, we're not going to provide the service. You owe us X number of dollars. And now they're coming out to me because I'm the employee. I'm the guy that vendor them. So it be, falls on my head that I'm the one responsible. I'm, I'm the boss. I'm the guy that hired you. So they're going to say, look, we took you in good faith that you were going to pay us. Now you didn't. So we're coming out to you. So how's that going to look? Your yeah. clients are going to be possibly lawsuits are going to come down the pike. And I hope not, but that's what it looks like. That a lot so, of may come down the pipe for people not getting paid. Yeah. So Jordan, in the vast majority of cases, even though FMSs are not getting are not getting paid by regional centers, in 95% of the cases, the staff are still getting paid. There was a, one particular FMS 
that I'm blanking on the name of. Maybe somebody can remember it and put it in the chat. But there was one particular FMS who was not paying staff for many months. M Emlyn. Thank yeah, that's GTI. You. Was that who yours was, Jordan? Emlyn? That's who a lot of people who complain about. Yeah. yeah. I, so I, Emlyn. And not just my staff, but my vendors weren't being paid. And don't, well, everybody, don't trust the ombudsman. I was going through the ombudsman, just my experience. I went to the ombudsman. I went to Vita Center. It took him months, months to pay my vendor, uh, vendor months for them to pay. And they send an invoice after invoice. And they, and they do the exact same thing that we know. Don't buy into that. Because, you know, I'm on the self advisory board. I, in the chair people know me i've been around so um uh, but they took they they claimed the exact same thing how they get around it in my experience was oh you dotted a t and crossed an i so we can accept it or by mistake instead of a service code you wrote 381 instead of three you, you missed yeah. instead of uh, you wrote 391 we won't accept right. it we can't fix it for you so we're not and they don't tell you that you switched around two numbers because you got dyslexia and you switched around two numbers and then three months go by and you realize you haven't paid somebody because you switched around a number and your FMS doesn't care. They just don't pay the bill. And then your people aren't paid. And that's been going on for a lot of people. And, and like you I said, agree. good ones. And my yes, advice real quickly was to, I told them six months ago to my region center and a lot of them just paused self-termination for a minute and fix these problems because you mm -hmm. can't be bringing more people in, piling it on if people aren't getting paid and there's a lot of problems. <laughs> That's so interesting that you're saying that everything you're saying, I agree with. Um, the the self-determination program is being paused just by default because FMSs are no longer taking new clients or they're putting them on long wait lists. They're, if you start today, no one's going in before May 1st, nobody. So there is a pause happening anyway, but um, it's not intentional. You're talking about an intentional pause to fix things. And um, I, this meeting I told you about where we're meeting with ARCA and some FMSs to try to think about legislation, we were coming up with all these kinds of ideas to streamline and fast track people into the program. And finally, we stopped saying that and said, we don't really care about streamlining it at this point. We care about fixing that for the people who are in it first, and then let's move forward. By the way, there was a three-year phase-in period. That was why there was a phase-in period, to see, identify these issues, fix them before it got statewide. These problems were never identified, so clearly they weren't even fixed. I, well, some of us identified them. I actually wrote this big report for the Statewide Self-Determination Advisory Committee on all of the barriers after the first three years that clearly got ignored. Because if you look at it and read it, it was written back in 2020, 2020, you'll see that nothing has changed in the three years since that document was written. So well, I'll say one last quick thing is every, I've been to a lot of advisory meetings, self-determination advisory meetings and from Harvard all over. And a lot of things that even today, or at least the last ones I've been to, keep talking about how many people, how many certified budgets do we have? How many this, how many that? I'm like, what's the point? You can, mm. you can certify all these budgets, but where are they going? We're giving them in a limbo and you haven't helped people that are in it. But still, yeah. you, they, the Reno Center still spends a lot of time talking about certifying all these budgets and people that are in. I'm like, are you hearing yourself? Where are they going? Where are you putting them? Where are they gonna, where are they gonna go? They leave their if they leave their support of living agency because they think they're in self-determination, then they're just in a limbo in purgatory. And yeah. you know, they're not getting out. You know, it's that's, that's you know. Anyway, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jordan. I really appreciate that. Connie or Harvey or Connie and Harvey. I'll start off first to my friend Jordan. Keep the faith. <laughs> like that great philosopher said, Yogi Berra, it ain't over with till it's over. And I, I just want to ask, um, I, I, you know, we're doing this because this is what is going to make sense to our kids and it's important, but I want to bring up another um, subject that I want to ask you how, what is happening with the survey? Because I, if our last meeting, it, I, I would recommend people not take it. Um, and I'm appalled at what it turned out to be. I just wondered if you have any more information on that lovely escapade. Oh, Connie. Um, so for those folks who are not at our last month's meeting, let me just explain what Connie's talking about. 
So many of most of you who are in the self-determination program probably got, I don't know if I can find it easily on my desk, but probably got something in the mail about uh, a survey that the UCLA Targent Center, Disability Rights California, and um, State Council on Developmental Disabilities, who is in charge, State Council is the one in charge, by the way, um, are supposed to be surveying participants and people who haven't gotten in yet or people who dropped out about what your, you know, what, what your experience has been and what your satisfaction levels are with the self-determination program. So the, that video is available on our interchange. Yeah, I urge you to watch it because it's quite something. But um, I, I admit that um, I never read the survey. I got the flyer in the mail and it said, take the survey. And I sent an email, there was an email of somebody on there. And I said, ooh, they're doing a survey. We should promote the survey at DVU. It said, it's so important. It's written into law, by the way. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They got $100,000 from DDS to put, to put out the survey. And they um, are required by the self-determination program. Connie's showing me what your flyer might have looked like. I didn't look at the survey. So I invited somebody from the UCLA Charging Center to come on. You. She was lovely and she was gracious. In the pro and I asked her to share her screen and walk us through the survey in case anybody had any questions. By the way, the reason I didn't do the survey is legitimate. Like literally the day after I got the survey, my husband had got COVID and then my son got COVID. I never got COVID, but it just became this like, you know, just ripple effect of nightmare in my family. And then, then we had our STP conference and then we had this STP Connect. So I, I, I take full responsibility for not having looked at the survey before bringing this woman on, but that those are my excuses. She starts going through the survey and the survey is really bad. Like it's really, really bad. Like it never uses the term person-centered plan in the entire survey. It never uses the term FMS or independent facilitator. It, it is as if it was written by someone who didn't had never read the self-determination law or had never known anything about the self-determination program. It was completely, it used weird terminology that doesn't even exist in the state of California. And um, it was basically taking the, the national core indicators, the NCI survey, and putting it into a survey on the self-determination program, which has nothing to do with it. And by the way, the survey was pretty much only for adults, even though 50% of the people in the self-determination program are children, because it asks tons of questions about where you live, who you live with, and your employment. So those of you who were there were quite courageous. I tried to be very nice, but many of you were quite courageous and basically said this survey was really problematic and it needs to be substantially modified. Or some of you said it needs to be scrapped and you need to start over. I reached out literally within an hour of the meeting apologizing because I didn't I didn't bring them on to actually uh, undermine them or to, to I, this, this wasn't, that wasn't my intention at all having not looked at it, but I did have the same conclusion that many of you did that it needed to be fixed um, completely from beginning to end. and. My understanding is that they had a meeting and said, we are not going to completely redo the, the survey, but we will make some changes. I did go into the survey a few weeks ago and saw that there were some mod tiny little changes that were made. Like they changed the word IP from planning some weird term that we don't use in California to the IPP. But they haven't, there's still all these weird questions that, they, they asked if people are conserved, which you know where we come out on conservatorship. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe you're even asking that question in this survey. But they, they still have a lot of, to me, offensive questions. And then they have a lot of irrelevant questions and they haven't changed it. So um, I did ask to meet with them. They have not asked, they, they did not respond and they did not ask for a meeting with me. Um, they are allegedly having a work group. Has anybody been requested? They, they are having some little work group. Tim, I believe your name was on the list of the work group. Did you get asked? Okay. So Tim is my key person because I know Tim's name was being floated around for that work group. So um, 
it's it's been a month. It's been a month since that STP Connect. I believe it was like December 14th or something. So um, I have heard nothing. And so I'm going to sadly have to agree with what Connie said, which is I cannot recommend you take the survey. Um, there were already allegedly 200 people who took the survey by the time we had that STP Connect. And many people said they don't want their survey results to be counted because the survey had so many problems. I would recommend you email the person on that flyer and you tell them, I want my survey pulled. And if enough people do that, they're going to realize they can't even count the 200 results that they got. So um, they need to change it. I haven't heard from them. It's been radio silence for a month. I know there's been holidays in between, but I, you know, it's now the 11th of January. I haven't heard anything of this year. Um, obviously, <clears throat> I'm very worried because the results are going to be distributed publicly and actually to the legislature. There's going to be testimony in the legislature about the results that's in the law. So obviously, I'm very, very concerned that the results are not going to actually show where people sit on the, in this program. So if you haven't taken it yet, I'd say hold off. Let's see if we can get some advocacy ready and see if we can move forward. I don't know if there's anybody on this in this group who has um, who has any more information, but I, I do not. Thanks for asking, Connie. Howard, oh, you know what? Let me go to um, Ed real quick. She has a long list of questions that are coming into the chat, and then I'll go to Howard and Beth. I certainly do. So next up we have from, let me get back to the correct tab, from Valdramita, what is required to be an independent facilitator? Can a parent be one for their adult child in the self-determination program? So um, there are requirements for an independent facilitator. They have to be trained on the principles of the self-determination program as well as the features of the program. Um, you And you have to be able to prove that. That is to be a paid independent facilitator. I mean, I do independent facilitation for my son all the time. I'm not getting paid to do it. I don't call myself as independent facilitator. I just help to arrange for services and supports for him like an IF would do. Um, so that's not a problem. But if you're calling yourself your own child's independent facilitator and you are going to take money from their spending plan, there are actual requirements. And it's not so much that you have to have certification, but you do have to prove that you've had training. Um, and by the way, there's a lot of training that exists out there. Um, the Autism Society of Los Angeles provides free training for independent facilitators. I, I believe that they're starting a new round very soon. Um, and so I, if, if that, that's a free way to do it, there's also people you can pay to help go through trainings. Um, and so you can look into those paid IF trainings as well. Um, the, uh, it, and if you are the parent of a child who is under the age of 18, you cannot be paid to be their independent facilitator or, by the way, any service provider for your child. The parent of an adult can be paid to be their independent facilitator as long as you follow the other rules. Go ahead. Um, Sure. Next up, we have from uh, Jenna. What's Vicki Smith's position? This was when folks were um, asking for her email. Yeah, um, she's something, some muckety muck. Hold on, let me see if it's in one of her. She is a special consultant, federal programs. No, she's bigger than that. She has some bigger job now. Hold on. I know she's like a deputy something or other. Hold on, let me, she she actually signed the most recent directive, I believe, the continuing the individual budget directive. Um, she did, she's the deputy director of policy and program development division. Here, I'm gonna put her title. Let's see if it works in the chat. That, 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 um, yeah, oh, it worked, yay. Some of you may remember Vicki as, uh, the head of the of the state councils, regional offices in various places. I know she was in the middle of the state at one point. I know she was down here in LA at one point. Great person. She's a really, really great person. 
Um, so we're hoping that she can actually do some good things there. Go ahead. We'll do one more with you, Ed, and then we'll go to Howard. Oh, sure, absolutely. Let me pick a let me, let me pick an urgent one. Um, Yadira asks: Are FMSs communicating to participants when regional centers are failing to pay them? And my understanding from an anonymous messages that I've received is that no, FMSs are not telling participants when they're not getting paid. Can you confirm, Judy? Uh, I yes, that that is what I'm hearing. Um, I can tell you that um, my FMS has never informed me about whether they're getting paid from the regional center. Um, and I don't see that as substantially different than the traditional system. I mean, there are some regional centers who pay traditional service providers very late. Sometimes it takes six months to get paid. And you wouldn't know if you're going to a if you're going to a day program, you don't know whether the regional center is getting paid for you. I honestly don't think it's it should be totally on us to have to know this. I think it would be interesting to know because then we can advocate for our FMSs, which whom we need to succeed. But um, yeah, Carola was saying that they take a long time to pay the independent facilitators too from from the regional centers. So regional centers, you know, have never been um, efficient in paying. Um, we're hoping that there's going to be a new in IT system for regional centers and for the entire system uh, over the next five, seven years. There's uh, the state budget came out yesterday. I should tell you a few things about that, but the state budget came out yesterday and there was a whole bunch of money to do planning for the new IT system. It, it can't be worse than what it is now because it's really bad now. Um, I'll just tell you real quickly, um, funding for self-determination and what there was nothing new, it continues the funding that we have for um, providing for the participant choice specialists at regional centers, as well as the funding for those monies that local advisory committees get to give out grants at the local level to help uh, bring pe move people into the program or support people in the SDP. So, um, so there's nothing new or changed there. Um, uh, I, I, there's, in fact, overall in the budget, I can tell you that the rate increases will hold, even though there's cuts in the budget overall in the state, the, the general state budget, DDS weathered very well and didn't face a lot of cuts. Um, so all of those rate increases will hold and the next one will go into effect in 2024. We, we've already had one in January 1st of 2023. Um, so if you haven't gotten that rate increase, you can go back and get that one if, if you need it, only if you need it. Um, and um, the other thing that they're doing is they're, there's the, um, their regional centers will continue to get their 900 new service coordinators and they're actually getting even more funding to create, to hire more service coordinators who are providing early intervention services. Um, DDS is continuing to grow its bureaucracy, um, not substantially, um, at, but they're adding an autism bureau, Connie Lapin. Um, it's, it's six new staff. I am, I am concerned. That's all I have to say is I am concerned. I am concerned they're going to be heavily ABA focused because the woman who's going to run the office is heavily ABA-ish. And I'm also concerned that it's all going to be about behavior and it's not going to be about communication and about supports that people need and about employment. Um, I'm looking at you, Sora Markowitz. You have, we need to involve you in, in this because there, there it is. I'm very concerned about it's going to be very, very traditionally looking at autism as opposed to the new progressive ways um, that people. And I'm really hoping that one of the six people they hire actually has autism because there's not a whole lot of people with developmental disabilities who actually work at DDS. Sorrel, did you have a comment on that? Go ahead. So I guess my question is, who is it that is going to be in charge of this? And I didn't hear exactly what you said about, is it a department? Yeah. I didn't hear that part. Yeah, so DDS, it, it hasn't happened for sure, but they've requested funding in the budget for six new positions to create a department of autism within DDS um, to provide training, to provide, I, I don't really, 
I, I'm not exactly sure, but I know that a lot of the DDS controlled institutional settings like intermediate care facilities and behavioral health homes um, are, are actually owned and run by DDS. And so perhaps they'll be providing supports for some of those homes as well. The woman who's gonna be running this office is their single only autism specialist in all of DDS. It's a woman named Laura, Lauren Libero. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, who's an ABA, an ABA person. Who, I don't, I mean, there's a lot of people who don't like ABA. My son benefited greatly from it. I, but I, I believe in choice. I believe people should have choice and and have the kind of intervention that really works for them. And so um, we can't have it where there's only one way. And Sorrel is the one that taught me that. So I just think that um, as this goes forward, it's going to be really important to have some voices who are seen to be um, <clears throat> very experienced and professional who really can really connect with DDS and say, you know, behavior is communication and mm -hmm. there isn't only one way to address it. So can we look at what the overarching um, role of this department really is and what what's the, uh, what's the goal of this department? What do you want people to know? Yeah. And what do you want people to be taught and yeah. be aware of? So I will make sure Maybe to that can happen. I will voluntold you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I apologize, but we only have two minutes left. Howard, I'm going to give you the last word if you had, still have something to say. Oops. Try it again, Howard. Can you unmute? Mm. There we go. Go ahead, Howard. My question is simply, why can't the state pay for um, FMS if the regional centers are not doing it? <laughs> You're not the only one. Somebody else wrote that in the chat. Why aren't, why isn't DDS directly paying um, the FMSs? DDS doesn't do that. You should know DDS doesn't pay service providers. There's no situation in which they do that in the state. Um, if you are a day program in the traditional system, you have to have a contract with the regional center and that is how you get paid. You do not get, the only people who get paid by DDS are those owned and operated institutional settings like intermediate care facilities or Canyon Springs, which is a very large institution. Those are the ones that are being paid directly from the state. Um, but in every other case, they contract with 21 regional centers to do that work. Um, and the regional centers should be held accountable for paying in a timely way. So what can we do? Um, well, that's where we're doing a lot of advocacy. The FMSs are doing a lot of advocacy on their own. Um, they've been meeting and meeting a lot with DDS, almost like a couple times a week at this point, they're meeting with DDS. So um, there, there's a lot of things happening and I'm just trying to be hopeful that these things are going to get solved in the next six weeks. What can I do to help you in this matter? You could you send an email to Nancy Bargeman and express your concern. Nancy needs to know this. I mean, she knows it, but the more she hears about it, I think can be helpful. Okay. Guys, it's six o'clock and I apologize that we are ending um, you know, when there's questions to be asked, but we will always be here. We will be back again in two weeks. Uh, I can't even remember. We have a topic and now I can't remember what it is. Maybe Ed remembers what it is, but we have a topic we're going to talk about. Um, and we will have the book done by then and we will have the videos to you. So, um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you and, uh, we will see you all in a couple weeks. Take care, all. Bye.